could bring the police over here where I live. What is your address? I don't know my address. I need to know if your mom is, is breathing. She said, miss. Okay, and what did you do then? There's blood all over the floor. Miss. Yes. I took pictures and I told my friends about it. Was that bad? You told who about it? My friends. <coughs> They're knocking the door. Miss, are they going to kill me? No, they're not going to kill you. This 911 call was made on October the 12th, 2023, from an apartment in Florida at 11.30 p.m. by a 13-year-old boy named Derek Rosa, shortly after murdering his own mother. But what could have possibly led this straight-A student to commit such a horrific crime? This case will leave you questioning every detail you hear, just as it has the police officers who investigated it. Before we begin, we would like to send our sincere condolences to all of the friends and family of Irina Rosa, whose life was taken away from her at just 39 years of age. Derek Rosa had recently turned 13 years old. He lived in Hialeah, Florida with his mom, Irina, and stepfather, Frank Ramos, and a half-sister who was only a few days old at the time. Rosa was in the eighth grade where he was described as a straight-A honor roll student. The principal at Derek's school described him as a very respectful, intelligent young man who never even raised his voice, let alone showed any signs that he could possibly hurt anyone. Neighbors of the family also shared the same opinions about him and were left truly devastated by, as they saw it, his out-of-character actions. On Thursday, October the 12th, 2023, the night was calm. Everything inside and outside of the family home seemed perfectly normal. Frank Ramos, Derek's stepfather, was working away in Georgia. He worked as a truck driver, so again, nothing out of the ordinary. Irina was in bed cuddling her newborn baby girl. The bedroom was dimly lit with a small lamp beside the bed. On the other side of the room, perhaps six feet away, was a cot belonging to the newborn baby girl. Within minutes of this image being taken, Irina would put her precious girl back into her cot and get into the bed for the night. For a short time, the room was in complete darkness. That is, until the door slowly opened, revealing a beam of light from the hallway that shone across the room. Derek was then shown standing over his mother while she is sleeping. After standing over her for a few seconds, Derek, knife in hand, launched a ferocious and unprovoked attack on his mother. Irina woke up and began screaming for her life. But by the time she had realized what was going on, she had already received multiple stab wounds and was bleeding uncontrollably. In truth, she never stood a chance. Irina had been stabbed over 40 times and was laying in a pool of her own blood as her resistance grew weaker before finally passing away. Amazingly, the baby girl continued sleeping and did not wake up once during the murder. Thankfully, she was not harmed. It was just a few minutes after his frenzied attack at approximately 11.30 p.m. that Derek Rosa called the police and confessed to murdering his mother. Within a few minutes, officers arrived at the home and instructed Derek to come outside and surrender with his hands up. Without providing any resistance, Derek obeyed the officer's commands and was arrested on the spot. With Derek secured, officers made their way into the home and through to the bedroom. Turning on the light, they discovered the horrific scene. Irina was lying sprawled out on the floor. The bed was covered with blood. It had even splattered onto the walls during the attack and formed a pool around the spot where her body lay. The little baby girl was still sleeping, blissfully unaware of what had just happened in the room. The cops were not shocked by the scene inside the house. They were shocked by Derek's reaction. He was incredibly polite to them and repeatedly apologized for what he had done. Officers on the scene say they expected Derek to try to attack them because of the nature of the murder. But no, he came quietly. Everyone from the police to the neighbors just couldn't make any sense of it. Derek was immediately taken to a juvenile detention center but had to be moved to a hospital after threatening to take his own life. Regardless of his mental state or age, a grand jury was convened at the earliest opportunity 
which indicted Derek for first-degree murder as an adult. Shortly after, he was transferred to the Metro West Detention Center, an adult county jail, where he was held without bond. Taking a step back for a moment, it is difficult to see how Derek can be tried as an adult. After all, he was just 13 years old. Yes, he committed a horrific crime, but surely he should be incarcerated with people his own age, not with grown men in a county jail. The police investigation was pretty straightforward when it came to the crime and the culprit. Derek had confessed over the phone and had waited in the home to be arrested. The knife used in the attack wasn't hidden. It was left in the open next to the victim's body. The big question was, why? And there was only one way to get answers during an interview. Much has been made so far about Derek and what potential issues he may have had lurking deep down. No motive has been provided for the unprovoked, vicious attack that he subjected his mother to. During interviews, police tried to get Derek to open up, but he came across as empty to the point of appearing to not care, not even wishing to offer any mitigation or excuse for his actions. Um. You go to school, right? What grade are you in? Eighth grade. Eighth grade? Yes. Uh, good student? Uh, A's and stuff like that? A's and B's. What, um, what, uh, what reading class are you in right now? You know? Uh, what do you take? Um, I just take language arts. Language arts? Okay. Derek seems fairly relaxed. Could it be that he just doesn't care? Or is it some mental issue that no one has uncovered yet? Not that any of these would justify what he had done. In the 911 call Derek had made, it was noted that he sounded a lot younger than an average 13-year-old. For example, he did not know his own address and phone number, and still didn't when the police spoke with him. What's your date of birth? August 26, 2010. Uh, what's your address? I don't know my address. Okay. What's your telephone number? You don't know it either? No. Okay. What type of phone do you have? An iPhone. An iPhone? What color is it? It's blue. It's blue? Yes. Okay. We know from Derek's school that he is a very intelligent young man who could have gone on to be an honor student. Is it really possible that a person with such a brain didn't know their own address or telephone number? Was Derek trying to play a game with the officers? Did he think that if he acted a bit stupid that it might play in his favor? And then uh, you were home the whole day or did you leave? I stayed home after school. You stayed home after school? Yeah. Okay. Um. The officers tried to get a picture of what Derek's day had been like. He described how he made his way to school on the bus as normal, but didn't do much work that day. After coming home, Derek said he just stayed in for the evening. Well, at around like, like 10, I went to bed. Okay. My mom did too. Is that your regular time? Like mm -hmm. nine? Yeah. Okay. You guys uh, explain to me about the apartment. You have your own room? Yes. And your mom? Yes, she has her own room. She has her own room. And your sister? She stays in the same room as my mom. Stays in the same room with your mom? And tonight, who was all there? Me, my mom, and my sister. The interviewer now starts to get to the point. He asks Derek about the evening, which he described as a perfectly normal night, apart from going to bed a little later than usual, all the time remaining perfectly calm, as if he was having a casual chat with a friend. You killed her? All right. Um, what, type of, what type of knife was it, do you know? It was just a big size kitchen knife. That big? Yeah. What color was the, the the handle? Purple. Purple? Yes. Okay. Uh, your mom was sleeping? Yes, she was sleeping. Okay. Um, explain to me. <clears throat> well, we'll get into that. Derek states that he went to sleep around 10 o'clock, but woke up a short time later. He then says, again, very calm and clearly, that he went to the kitchen, picked up a kitchen knife with a purple handle, made his way to his mom's room where she was sleeping, and stabbed her to death. This was, of course, a tactic by officers. 
Firstly, Derek is only 13, so they have a duty of care towards him as a minor. Secondly, if they went too hard with their questioning, it was quite possible that Derek may get scared or panic and refuse to talk to them any further. At this point, Derek had refused legal representation, and this is the prime time for officers to get as much detail as they can. For when a lawyer is eventually requested, they could possibly tell him to answer no comment to every other question. Uh, after you killed her. My stepdad has, I mean, he owns two guns. He has a Glock 19. Okay. And then, uh, I don't know what to call it, another one. Okay. What color are they? The Glock 19 is black, and then the other one has a silver slide and then like a dark bluish handle. Okay. Um, so, what did you do with the guns? He always has his uh, Glock 19 with him at mm -hmm. all times. Mm -hmm. And since he's a truck driver, he was at home, he was far away. Okay. So I went into the closet. Mm -hmm. I found uh, his book bag because he goes shooting at gun ranges. Okay. I grabbed the gun. I put the magazine in the gun, okay. I pulled back the slide, but I, wanted, I didn't want to shoot myself. If you didn't know better, you could be forgiven for thinking that Derek had been sleepwalking or under heavy sedation during the murder and during the police interview. There isn't even a hint of denial. He happily explains what he did and how he did it, and then says he was going to commit afterwards, but states that he didn't want to himself. A very important choice of words that we will talk about later. After the killing, Derek said that he called his friends to say goodbye. How many friends did you call? Only one. What's his name? I don't know his real name. He's an online friend. He's an online friend? Yeah. When you say online friend, what do you mean? From video games? Yes, from video games. I know him real well. Okay. How long have you known him? Since like I was 10, 3 years. Three years? Three years? Have you ever met him? No, I've seen his face. you seen his face? Yeah. So how did you communicate with him? My cell phone. Through your cell phone, so you have his number? Yes. And you don't have him stored under a certain name, or you used to have him stored under a gamer tag? I have him. I made up an, a name for him. You made up a name for him? Yeah. What name did you make up for him? Sweden. Sweden? Sweden. S-W-E-E-D-E-N. Okay. The next part of the interview is particularly intriguing and clearly grabs the attention of the interviewing officer. Derek says that he only called one friend after deciding not to shoot himself. The two had met through playing video games online but had never met in person. Derek says that he didn't even know the other person's real name, but the made-up name for him, Sweden spelled with a double E, when not playing video games the two would communicate by cell phone. Could this be a small breakthrough? Derek didn't know this person, but said they had been communicating with him since he was 10 years old. Was Sweden an older man who had groomed Derek by filling his mind with dangerous thoughts and fantasies about killing a family member? At this point, we don't know, but it wouldn't be the first time that a young person had been coerced into doing something stupid by a so-called online friend. Derek then explains how he sent three pictures to Sweden, two of his mom dead on the floor and one of himself. Sweden's reply was apparently, I can't believe it. A reaction of shock by his so-called friend or a reaction of pride in what he had managed to get someone to do on his behalf. No doubt, Sweden is a person of much interest to the police, and they will try to track down his whereabouts. All Derek said he knew was that Sweden lived in the U.S. Were you wearing the same clothes you're wearing now? Yeah. Uh, there's some red stains there. Is that blood? I think it is. Okay. I have a little bit of blood on my hands. On your hands too? Yes. Okay. Moving on from the mysterious Sweden, the officer confirms that Derek had not changed since the murder. He points out that Derek had some red stains on his clothes. Derek then calmly points out the blood on his hands as well. This is perhaps the most chilling part of the whole interview, the casual way in which Derek examines the blood stains on his clothes and hands. 
This is his mother's blood. The person who carried him around for nine months gave birth to him, fed him, clothed him, kept a roof over his head, and kept him safe for 13 years. Yet Derek does not bat an eye. He describes the stains as if someone had just pointed out that he had a mud stain on his shirt. Um, and then she woke up? Yes. Did you say anything else to her? Did she say anything to you or no? No, she just screamed. She just screamed? Yes. Okay. Um, why did you stab your mom? Can you go to the bathroom before I answer that? Yes, of okay. course. Of course. Give me one second. You want to thank him for me? Derek is once again asked about his mother's reaction. It may seem a stupid question, but all of the facts have to be established. Derek described aiming for her neck first, where he would hit an artery. Then she woke up and simply screamed. When asked for his motive, Derek asks for a bathroom break. Once back, the officers asked Derek about his social media usage. This was a way to change the subject a little and hopefully put Derek back at ease. They have to remember that he is legally a child and needs to be handled carefully. The question of motive clearly made him uncomfortable. After a short time, they once again ask about the motive, at which point Derek says that he won't answer without a lawyer. And at that point, the officers were forced to stop the interview. On October the 24th, following the incident, Derek's family and attorney attended court for the plea hearing. Derek was not present. His family pled not guilty on his behalf and begged the judge to release him on house arrest because of his age. Somewhat surprisingly, family from both sides testified on his behalf in the belief that he should not be treated or tried as an adult. It's very unfortunate that this tragedy occurred, but this child is very humble, very peaceful, and nobody could imagine that this would ever happen. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult, but... I guess what we're asking for is another opportunity, it's a second chance to help him grow and become mature as a grown man to, to put this behind him and say, mm, we have your back. Much to the surprise of the court, members of the public with no connection to the family also turned up to speak in support of Derek. For us, it's it's very important, like he go to class, like he go therapy, he go to patio, and all that stuff. It's really important for a kid like 13 years old. That's all we matter. And we are here to fight for his rights. The case was clearly splitting public opinion. There were more liberal people who thought that he should, because of his age, be given a second chance, while others believed he had committed a very serious crime and had behaved like an adult at the time, so why shouldn't he be treated as one in the justice system? Regardless of the support for Derek, a judge decreed that he would remain behind bars. On November 28th, the case was back in the court again. This time, along with his family and attorneys, Derek was present. This time, with house arrest completely out of the question, the defense attorney moved to have Derek transferred to a juvenile detention center. Unfortunately for them, this was refused, but the judge did leave the question open by saying he would seek further constitutional law on the subject. After seeking further legal advice, it was ruled that Derek would be treated as an adult and remain in the county jail. The rights and wrongs of housing a 13-year-old in an adult jail with grown men is certainly up for debate, but as far as the U.S. goes, there is a strong precedent for it. At the turn of the 21st century, 250,000 minors were charged as adults, but by 2019, this had decreased by 80% to just 53,000. The number of minors in adult prisons or county jails peaked at 10,420 in 2008 and then sharply declined to just 2,250 in 2021. Also in 2021, local jails had custody of 1,960 minors with state and federal adult prisons holding just 290. So while the numbers are on decline, Derek is far from the only one to be judged by the crime he committed rather than his age. The family were visibly devastated in court. Of course, they must have had extreme concerns about the potential harms that could come to Derek, who was a boy, when left alone with grown men. Derek has not yet gone on trial. His last date was set for late January, but that was canceled. 
The next date is expected to be set for sometime later in February. For the time being, Derek remains in the juvenile wing of the Metro West Detention Center. The family have hired renowned defense attorney Jose Baez, who famously represented Casey Anthony, who was acquitted of the murder of her daughter. In the meantime, as you can expect, theories and rumors have been swirling around as to why Derek Rosa, a seemingly normal boy from a good family, would commit this crime. Supporters of Derek, who attended the court hearings from as far away as Chicago, said, Derek was manipulated. A lot of kids get manipulated on the internet, and we think he is innocent. One theory, however, has gained some credibility relating to strange things that he said at the time and could explain Derek's silence about his motives. During the 911 call, it was noticed that there appears to be a second voice on the recording. Listen. I need to know if your mom is, is breathing. She's dead, miss. There's blood all over the floor. Let us play that for you one more time. I need to know if your mom is, is breathing. She's dead, miss. There's blood all over the floor. Just as the 911 call handler asks, is your mom breathing? A voice in the background appears to say, no. Whose voice was this? Was it someone else in the apartment? Could it be someone on the phone or the sound from a gamer's headset? At the moment, no one can be sure, but it is hard to deny that there is a third voice not belonging to Derek or the 911 call agent. Was Derek being coerced? Was he put up to this murder? These are all questions that need answering. Also, on the 911 call, Derek asked the handler if it was bad of him to send photos to his friend. This could have been the moment that Derek realized he had made a huge mistake. When describing the gun in the home, Derek talked about killing himself, but then, as we mentioned earlier, he said he didn't want to. An odd choice of words. If he had said, I got scared or I couldn't do it, then that might have made more sense. Taking one's own life must be terrifying, and to a certain degree, it takes guts to do it. But Derek said, I didn't want to. Has this young man been groomed and talked into killing his own mom, then killing himself? His words certainly suggest that there is a lot more to this story than meets the eye. Why send photos of his deceased mom and himself? Was this to prove that he had carried out the crime as instructed or coerced to do? If Derek was groomed from the age of 10, possibly by his friend, Sweden, that no one has met, it is possible that he is too scared to come clean about why he committed the murder for fear of reprisals. We must stress at this point that Sweden, as he is known, has not been arrested for any criminal cases and may be completely innocent in this whole saga. Then again, we certainly can't rule out the possibility that Derek did all of this on his own. If he was scared of saying something through fear, why was he so relaxed in the police interview? He spoke openly and didn't seem afraid of slipping up and maybe dropping somebody else's name in the investigation. The one reason for the speculation about the third-party involvement came from the evidence hearings. The defense attorney for Derek requested that his team be given access to the apartment where the murder had taken place. Initially, Frank Ramos, the stepfather of Derek, refused and did not want anyone entering the home. Many people are very suspicious as to why he wouldn't want anyone there. Of course, it was a traumatic experience for him, but surely he would want all the facts to come to light during the trial. From a sentimental point of view, there wasn't any chance of disturbing anything that belonged to Irina. The request was made two months after the incident, so the whole crime scene had been cleaned up. But again, this is all speculation, and we can cast no aspersions on Frank Ramos in this situation. All of the details have to come out during the trial, but one thing is for certain. For the time being, this case leaves more questions than it answers. Of course, we at Beyond Evil will bring you updates on the trial when it has taken place, and hopefully all of the missing gaps will be filled in. It should be quite a trial. With all that has gone on and is still going on with this case, it would be easy to forget the real reason why we brought this case. A 39-year-old woman, Irina Rosa, was murdered as she slept a few feet away from her newborn daughter. A young woman in the prime of her life who was no doubt feeling very good at the time she was murdered in her bed. 
She had a wonderful partner, a home, and a son who was doing well in school, and a newborn baby. Thanks to the as-of-yet unexplained actions of her brother, a very little girl will now grow up without her mother. The only slim silver lining is that she did not wake up during her mother's final moments in this world. Frank Ramos will now be left to bring up his little girl alone while still mourning the loss of his wife. Hopefully his daughter will grow up to look like her beautiful mother and act as a constant reminder to Frank of what he had with Irina for the time they were together. We at Beyond Evil would like to send our very best wishes to all of the family and friends while they work their way through the grieving process. Rest in peace, Irina Rosa. Thank you for watching. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below with your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. On your way out, don't forget to hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadow.